Good afternoon. Um, it's been quite a while since I've done one of these, and I felt the compulsion to actually do one of these things because I am getting annoyed at what is once again private citizens being victimized by misrepresentation and misunderstanding that's being presented in news reports um, the fact that um, some yet to be revealed wizard has decided to um, hunt the country down for someone that looks like um, she might fit the parameters of um, To make his case and with sleight of hand and other methods um, get the country <coughs> bickering over nothing <coughs> and uh, numerous issues that really are under our control to be made irrelevant um, I feel I ought to speak about this. So first, I'm going to talk about the background of this of this story. What the facts have been purported to be. I'm not going to certify that I'm going to get everything absolutely correct, but I um, do hope that it will be materially close. <clears throat> so there's a woman named, um, let's see, uh, Rachel Dolezal. And she is, or was, the president of the NAACP in Spokane, Washington. Uh, I have a lot of things to say about a lot of various levels of this whole thing. Um, for one, in a perfect world, we wouldn't need a NAACP. Um, but I'm old enough, <laughs> and therefore not naive enough to believe that it's an unnecessary institution. Um, there have been, there are many people, <laughs> there's a numerous reactions that have come out of this whole um, set of circumstances, but if you, know, if you examine each one of these little things that are being said that are, are absolutely unfair to, um, Ms. Dolezal, including statements from, uh, I hate to, you know, from her own parents that have been absolutely <coughs> ridiculously unfair, unthoughtful, and oversimplified. I um I, I feel I have to speak because no one's really speaking up for a little more thoughtful um, analysis of this whole thing. So. Rachel Dolezal um, grew up in a household, just as to do what I believe the facts to be. Grew up in a household where there were, she had four adopted siblings, of which they were of African American descent, okay, <laughs> in the recent past, okay. Um, she uh, grew up, not sure, probably in the Northwest, I don't know exactly where she grew up, that's really immaterial. Um, she had, after leaving her parents' home, as everybody does, went to Mississippi for a while, it's unclear if she was in college there, or was in a transition period, eventually she went to Howard University. Now her parents are, are white, as people foolishly attach labels of race to people as if it matters, as if it should matter. Um, people have, by making race seem to matter, have caused race to matter. And that is the one of the major problems that we have today, is that we're actually perpetuating um, 
race as being a problem. I'm not against the NAACP, don't get me wrong. Um, I'm not against any advancement of any group that has obviously interests to pursue. Um, <clears throat> but I would highly wish that some things would be the pa that the past would be left alone in some issues, that, but that has to come later in this conversation. Because first, we're talking about an individual person, but the individual person that we're talking about is, of course, affected by the thoughts and attitudes and perceptions of millions of people she has to interact with. And that, of course, includes a large group of people that are um, influenced by what's said upon the media and what is said in over oversimplification. I am extraordinarily upset at some of the oversimplification that's taking place. The first thing to get straight is that we as people, whoever we are, um, really only are, um, could, can only be responsible for our own actions and how we treat others. That is to say, um, The fact that um, certain historical events have taken place that were much to the chagrin of certain groups, um, I took no part in it and no living person on this planet today is taking part in those events. To, be, to oversimplify this and to speak for a group that has never really complained, I can say that um, as a um, descendant of some very early Dutch ancestors, um, some things had transpired in what is now called New York City, in which some of their property was deprived. Everybody has a complaint over some time period in some manner about things that have happened. Some remember it more than others. We each are pretty much um, we're, are only capable of stopping those uh, of things that we, that we have nothing to do with. Um, we, we can stop ourselves from complaining about things we have nothing to do with. Or we can choose to perpetuate them and have complaints and have a dog-eat-dog -dog kind of one-upping world where supposedly if you have some special box checked off by your name you're supposed to have some special right accrued to you. On the other hand, sometimes the people have the boxes checked off by their names don't have a special right accrued to them, but people assume that they do. And that is actually the case of uh, Dolezal here. So, reading one of this, <laughs> this early article by the Coeur d'Alene Press that started this whole firestorm. But first, let's, let's start with the woman we were talking about. So, she is definitely a community leader. She's not dumb. She's a professor. She's more educated than I am. Um, her um, academic choice uh, was um, African American history, which she teaches over at Eastern Washington University, and she's on the board of the Spokane Police Ombudsman Commission. Uh, it's a group of people that were picked by the Spokane City Council to um, I guess um, at least pick a new police ombudsman. It's a panel of five people of which there is one individual who has said that he is unhappy with 80% of the um, of every action this group has done and it's, it's so far as I could tell 
<laughs> I haven't done enough, and there isn't enough documentation about this group to really know what supposed controversial things that they've done to justify a statement like that. Um, nonetheless, um, that's the group that she is on, and uh, they're in the process of picking a new uh, police ombudsman, which is basically supposed to be an advocate for um, the public in, in relationship to uh, supposed or you know, suspected or reported uh, abuses by the police against citizens. It's, uh, to my mind, <laughs> it is a very good, a very important check and balance um, to start. It doesn't look like the committee has a lot of power. And it looks like um, there are actually people in that, that raise complaints that are simply being ignored. I don't know if the, the board has teeth. I, I really don't know what's going on exactly. Okay, so she is also apparently the um, leader of the chapter of the NAACP in Spokane. Educated woman. I don't know what her degree level is, but she does have a degree in African American. I'm not even going to say what it is. It, it, it's in the subject of African American. Don't know exactly, but it's somewhat specialized, and she's knowledgeable about this. Now, under, one thing I really have to say that is so fundamental to this, this whole issue. Uh, on the one hand, is that um, it's a very complicated issue. People do not tend to forget when they've been through, um, let's see, unpleasant experiences because of things they have no control over. That, you know, um, to ask people to do that is a very difficult thing to do. And then if there's no evidence that they're forgetting will cause other people to forget their preconceptions in kind, it almost seems unrealistic. And this is why I'm not against the NAACP. But I am pro and I am for a certain attitude for people to have. What is that attitude about race? The attitude about race is that everybody are just simply people. Um, and that culture is separate from a person or appearance. Culture is as dynamic and can, uh, is transferable and transportable as anything can ever get, actually. Um, that is to say, there's n nothing, there was no f scientific force that caused the culture that landed in, say, China not to have landed in Russia and vice versa, or the American Indian culture to have, for some reason, not originated in Germany, or <laughs> race and culture are not linked. What is what is important in a person's um, beliefs, morals, um, really has everything to do with the people that they were surrounded by. Because as a matter of survival, um, human beings are social animals. And human beings do tend to want to interact with other people. And in doing so, um, they adjust their behaviors to the people they interact with. As do the people that interact, it's, it's a two-way street, it's reflective, it kind of, you know, this is why we're still not wearing the same clothes we wore in the 1960s. Things do change over time, but for the most part, um, no one really has a majority of influence on culture that surrounds them. Well, if Mrs. Dolezal had been surrounded during her whole life with four siblings of African-American descent who had brought with them their own culture into the household, and she was educated, and I, I think I may even remember that she actually was attending college in Mississippi prior to going to Howard as well, um, 
and the fact that she had African American husband, she has African American children, or at least of um, some African American descent, or at least maybe identified by glance as being African American. Um, certainly from the perspective of her life and of the things that she admires and um, has culturally looked, in, culturally looked into, it's just a matter of fact that she <laughs> identifies mostly with the African American culture and perhaps even uh, some of her views may be quite similar to what mine are and that is to say that um, what her race is is actually unimportant and, and less important as to what her culture is. That is to say that if I were snatched from birth and brought to say a random country in China and raised there and suddenly at the age of that's more extreme obviously than what has happened to her obviously I mean yeah obviously but um, if I'd grown up my whole life in China, I would probably look and sound and act like a person from the Chinese culture. Which is just as valid as any other culture. All cultures are just as valid as the other. I have nothing against, I'm not for any culture, I'm not against any culture. To presuppose that any culture is a threat to any other culture is irrational, stupid, and as is racism was, irrational, stupid, and a tool for people without the intelligence to um, find ways to um, improve their own lives had to degrade the lives of others. Um, but we're also, I doubt there's anybody that's alive that's been here more than 100 years. And for people to say that um, when they look at history that's over a hundred years old and realize or that um, or the people that are in power to do let's put it this way the people that are in power today are not the same people that are in power in the 1950s um, for anybody to, to, to speak in terms of the 1950s being um, so recent as to keep their, their radar up for impending in certain acts of discrimination that will most definitely come their way is really only serving to one, freak themselves out, and two, to communicate a message to others that um, there is a divide that won't be forgiven no matter how little you were involved with the original misdeed that was done. Now, I do have a theme, and it goes far outside this particular topic, and it's, it's involved on other topics and other issues that I, that I make recordings about in the future. They're historical items, and basically whenever our country embraces some kind of um, evil, um, there are repercussions and they could last for quite some time. I do understand that. I'm, I pretty much am an, an advocate for dropping, especially things that are far beyond the spans of our own lifetimes, um, and trying to move forward. Um, and race was an evil that our nation had um, become involved with as an institution, and there's many others, including profiling, um, is an evil that our country still does to this day and has done for many years, and that's probably one of the major problems that we have in this country. When this is said, now let's just look at this article here go over some of these things. So she's basically an educated woman who identifies with the black cult uh, culture. She has, she wears clothes that 
make her appear to be African American um, by outsiders, but her that may be simply her choice that she likes her perm, she likes her tan, and she likes the clothing which she wears. She doesn't just wear clothes for everybody else, but perhaps for her own taste. This is what's forgotten in this article, amongst many other things which I'll mention. So here is the first paragraph asserts something that I have. I, I will question what's not written, but is we're asked to read between the lines about. <sighs> She's risen from the North Idaho civil rights champ to champion to positions of power in Spokane as a self-described black woman. Well, what if Rachel Dolezal is really white and all this stuff right there? And I'll say it doesn't. A few things. One, it's none of my, it's none of our fucking business whether she's really white. None of her fucking business. It could, be, it could be a Chinese person. It could be a fucking alien from Jupiter that is the president of the NAACP in Washington. What has to be what it is about is this person is helping out a group that has interests that it wants to pursue and it has the right to do that. So I don't give a damn if Rachel Dalizal is is Chinese. <laughs> I don't you know, or, you know, a Martian. <laughs> it doesn't fucking matter. Okay, let's read it. Okay. Dolzo Dolzo, chair of the Spokane's Office of Police Ombudsman Commission and president of the city's chapter of the NAACP has made claims in the media and elsewhere about her ethnicity, race, and background that are contradicted by her body. Well, and this, I would say, this is completely false. And this, I'll, I'll go into this exactly why. When you look into the details here, you find out that um, Delizel's application lists um, her ethnicity as white American Indian and and black let's go back to the example of me being snatched up as a baby and dropped in the middle of fucking China and raised by Chinese parents okay you're gonna drop me here put the same clothes on and sit me in a fucking chair and you're gonna ask me if I feel like I'm a white dude under those circumstances, I'd probably say no. <laughs> okay? <laughs> it's fucking simple. Um, so, the fact that her life has been heavily influenced by um, exposure to uh, and involvement with family members who are African American and their uh, the issues that they had um, come across during their life has everything to do with her response and it has everything to do with uh, the, if she had not mentioned African American in her response it actually would be misleading in her case if I if I had been snatched up and taken to China <laughs> and, and moved back here at my age now suddenly sat in a chair and if I asked what my race was it actually would be misleading for me just to say white because certain people most people assume that when they say white on the application that and this is, this is horrifically unfortunate and it's actually rather stupid um, to assume um, certain things about the quality of my life up to this point the conditions I lived in or the um, um, the culture that I embrace um, people can develop changes to their culture in a very short short amount of time just ask Patty Hearst and you'll find out um, especially when you're surrounded by people and the, mo the most important thing about Patty Hearst is not that she was brainwashed. I'm not, I'm not even insinuating that Mrs. Dolezal was brainwashed. I will, in fact, um, assert that that term is a little, 
is actually misguided in as much that we all are brainwashed by our own cultural beliefs and values based upon the people we have to interact with. I would definitely have different values and um, beliefs had I grown up in a completely different environment in a different area than I did here and the fact that I have a certain I'm of a certain race uh, has no impact on whether I would say perhaps adopt the ethical moral values of perhaps India <laughs> just pick on them now um, if I had been raised there language everything but as we knew with Patty Hearst, it was just a matter really of surroundings and socialization of the individual that um, that we focus on um, and what effect that it has on the person. So, you know, if you grow up in an environment in which you're with upper middle class African Americans, um, you will tend to act more like them. Um, the, f the, the actual race of this person is immaterial as to, as to her leadership of, the N of her chapter of the NAACP. It really has everything to do with her beliefs. Um, I really think the NAACP should be the National Association for the Advancement of Disadvantaged People. And it should represent not just people of color, but everybody. Because um, it, there's no, just because you're white uh, doesn't mean that you did not have to grow up in a bad neighborhood or um, did not have to deal with police discrimination or anything that um, many <laughs> people actually complain about um, with this. And I was also the... Um, absolutely disgusting insinuation that somehow that this supposed dishonesty well she's white you know uh, first of all the first question to ask is just to tackle this stupid issue um, does are women that work for the NA are we saying the women that work for the NAACP are not allowed to go to the tanning salon or get a perm she's not allowed to do that she has to make sure she looks extra white lest the public assume that she is trying to misrepresent herself. Second thing we don't have is we, don't have the, we do not have the smoking gun as to what actually it is that she supposedly got as a benefit as a result of supposedly impersonating a black person. What was this magic benefit that she received? I'm certain even in the latest video where um, she's interviewed by a man whose interview has actually been highly edited only to pick out the snippets that really sting and bring home the point that was already seems to be uh, attempted to be driven by some fucking wizard in the background who's or <laughs> Mr. Burns um if you actually look at her, you you can blatantly see that she is white by all appearances, and you know unless you want to assert that you think that every staff member that she works with is lacks the intelligence to discern that she's a Caucasian <laughs> um, is the only way you can, in which I will not even entertain as being serious but more as a challenge um, you you can't say that she is posed as an African American and therefore has risen amongst the ranks of the NAACP an organization by the way that was founded by not only Caucasians but African Americans as well and other groups um, and is employed it doesn't have an exclusive employee roster of only African Americans. They don't have a litmus test because there are people as me that I'm very well aware that 
the fact that discrimination has taken place on this planet um, to any group makes me just as vulnerable to the same dis discrimination and any other group just as vulnerable because all it proves is that human beings and their irrational stupidity and their clamoring for power will come up with excuses and distortions of fact and spin to try to gain her just a few more bits of advantage in the public opinion spin room um, to um, to get their way on the next say election or <laughs> with the debate and this vote here or there if they could do a really good star report perhaps they might win the presidency by 500 votes in Florida um, let's get back to this so now then we have her mother who can only see in terms of her her actual race does not see in a more dynamic sense the um, certainly Miss Dolezal has had her life influenced and shaped somewhat by African-American culture and she's embraced it and she loves it and that's fine um, what dis type of dishonesty are we talking about here but let's just okay it is disturbing that she's become that she has become so dishonest. What what exactly is what exactly is disturbing? Might, might I ask? Again, we have no smoking gun. What exactly? What exactly? What special favors was um, Ms. Dolezal actually given as a result of? being f fooling the public into thinking she's black certainly there are a number of African Americans that believe that being identified as as black is to their detriment and as much that that is the true fact it's the most fucking disgusting thing in this in this country hands fucking down Um, but as much as that it's not true, it's unfortunate that the very thoughts of oppression serve to oppress the people that think them. But nonetheless, um, I'm trying to strike a balance here, but these are, this is the way I do believe, is to do try to put the bad things behind you, but you have to be realistic about where, when you are discriminated against. There's no real answer. There's no black and white question here. But had Ms. Dolezal been able to be selected for her position because she was black or was given money because she was black or given a scholarship to Howard because none of that evidence is coming up. In fact, she got into a lawsuit with Howard um, and felt she had been discriminated against because she was white. Really, the true issue is this is a woman who not only rejects racial discrimination in any fashion, but also happens to love the African American culture and has had a. Um, the culture has had a been inspirational and an influence on her and she's embraced it and she has emerged herself in it I don't see the fucking crime so okay Dolezal grew up in northwest Montana okay so, you know I mean if we focus on the fact I mean where if you have a smoking gun please do tell now the smoke. Oh, let's get into this. The smoking guns seem to be that there was um, reports of her receiving hate mail, and then when that continued, when she went to Spokane, well, they just started to not believe it for some reason. Oh, we got a story here. <laughs> I don't really understand that. Um, there are some people that are uncomfortable with the idea of anybody crossing the boundaries of the group in which someone lies, especially if it is their own. 
Um, this is just a fact of human nature. And um, there are people that are against, you know, otherwise normal people that there still are for some reason that seems insane to me um, against, um, say, getting into a relationship with someone of a different ethnicity than, than the one they are. It's just absolutely insane. People just are people, and they just happen to look different. And they have a culture that really doesn't necessarily have to land with the race that they are. Although there's a strong correlation to it, it doesn't necessarily mean it has to end up that way. Um, now, Bill Zoll's application for appointment of the spoken ombudsman was signed and submitted, and the application was acquired by the press. Okay. Can we see it? <laughs> Where is it? Do you have any comments on it? Does she say she's exclusively African? No, they don't say that here. But in another report, they do say that she said that she's white, African American, and Indian. I haven't seen the first hand. I would prefer to see the first one myself. But, you know, in what business is it me to sit here and make judgment on someone I don't even fucking know doing things that has nothing to do with my life? Um, but nonetheless, um, what it does have to do with me is, um, once again, as can happen to anybody, and you, you know, that's what you really should be concerned about, is that if you happen to be of a mix of attributes that are attractive to some weasel in the um, media spin room, you know, the Mr. Burns in the box um, that likes to make his political point by crushing people under the spokes of his media power, um, then you'll find out really quick that um, this is something you ought to have been concerned about too, because you really don't want to see this kind of shit happen to anybody. Um, the, this kind of shit happens when people are not getting their way with honest political debate, so they, they go and they resort to this kind of crap. I think this has something to do with what's really what's going on in the Spokane Police Ombudsman Commission, quite frankly. Um, it does go down here, oh, selection committee, well, we thought there was two people at the interview, well, we thought that, you know, and they say, well, ethnicity was not a criterion for selection, certainly was taken into consideration, Coddington said, okay. Now, let's ask this question. Why not? I have a lot of questions here. Um, first of all, um, did Coddington announce to all the candidates that, quote, while ethnicity was not a criterion for selection, that it was certainly taken into account? Did she suddenly, before applying for this position, decide to go out and get a perm and a tan and start wearing the clothes she does? Or has she been wearing that shit for years? I, she's been wearing that shit for years. Is it her fault that Coddington thinks that having an African American on the council is necessary? Rather than just looking at the person's you know, um, qualifications. No, it's not her fucking fault. Diversity is the section of the two old city ordinance that details age and residency, qualification requirements, also listed six characteristics given to serious consideration in the appointment process. One of them is the individual's ability to contribute. The diversity of the commission, so to make up the commission, reflects the diversity of the people most likely to have contact with members of the police department, you know, including geographic, racial, hogwash. Um, now, in general, I'm a cr I am critical of these kinds of, um, somehow, if you um, appoint, say, the only... Um, 
Eskimo that is a resident of um, Spokane's county that they have a diverse group there it, uh, you know basically the county has a certain di uh, demographic and of course if you, if you pick a council of everybody being ethnic it's not going to reflect the dynamic um The police, it says here, the police oversight committee has a significant amount of power in the Spokane city government. I think it has barely none. Now there's a lady, I, I've seen a video, I have a copy of a video of one of these hearings I looked at this morning. There's a lady that apparently has been trying to get some issue addressed for quite some time in the... Um, with the Ombudsman Commission and they say in there, in fact, let me just try to just play some of this. Um, basically what transpires is that they don't, they seem to be more or less ignored by the police. And we have this stupid problem of this confidentiality bullshit, which is a whole other topic, which does need to be addressed and fixed. Um, however, in general, it becomes quite apparent that the um, med members of the committee are actually quite powerless to even do anything. <laughs> They probably feel more threatening than they are. Welcome to the Office of Police Ombudsman Commission. Question also. It's been through that it goes into the waste basket and nothing is going to be done. If he means mm -hmm. that, and I'll leave it up to him to explain. Conversations that. with the chief. So when you guys are saying you're working on this and getting it big to roll. Right, and I'd like to just clarify that. Um, Understanding from, uh, we did the constructs. He did not respond to my phone calls. And neither did Teresa Sanders, who is, I think, the assistant mayor or whatever her title is. They do not communicate. I was surprised that I even... Okay, so let me just get one thing straight. Now, what I believe is going on here is basically the members of the committee have tried to follow up on this individual's complaint. That's just a flat belief that I have. I could be wrong on that, but I, I do believe they have because they all say they did. And we'll watch and we'll see whether as it always is the case with um, the government and individuals that are above the law, nothing ever, ever comes of complaints. Individuals that are anointed as above the law and, and somehow angelic in our, in our um, society are usually very arrogant, as we, we will find out here. That's it, and I faxed you a copy, so you're aware of that, right? So I'm here to find out what is the status, if there's any status at all. Well, the last time that um, the vice chair and I met with the chief of police, Chief Straub, we did discuss um, the, uh, your ongoing concerns, because you've brought this to us several times now, and he did say that he was going to look into it again, and so he's going to be re-looking at the situation. So. Um, that's 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 the last uh, correspondence that or last communication that we had with Chief Straub about it is that. So it sounds like they're just there, and all they're really able to do is go to the chief and say, "Hey, chief, um, this lady has a complaint," and he can just say, oh, "I'll get back to you," and he could just blow them off, basically. He has listened to the commission and is going to be. Re taking another look at um, the surrounding information about your case. And if Kevin has any any other additional comments that he'd like to give, he was also at that meeting with Chief Strong. Right, so I have a question also. Is it your understanding, Ms. Isabel, that you have an open complaint with the, yeah. with the Ombudsman's office? Okay, let's just get... Let's, just, let's get to this. Now, this is going to be a disgusting display. 
and I'm not saying it's the fault of this commission um, necessarily this commission is put in almost an impossible circumstances you will see what the implication is by the way you know this is mrs dull's all he didn't know um what he's gonna ask is do you have an open complaint with the police then he, he he doesn't have the heart to continue and some other guy comes in and he'll say well we were told that your case was closed he's not gonna look into it again um And you, it'd be very, be very clear that this lady keeps coming back to this commission not because she wants money, but because she wants an apology. And she doesn't want whatever happened to her to happen to anybody else again. Um, and what happens is they go to the police. The police will do their internal investigation. First, they won't find anything, right? they'll say well we didn't find anything of course they won't find anything it's like asking the wolf to guard the chicken coop or was there a letter sent to you and then a request for more information or maybe mr Beggs can talk to that please yeah so um my understanding from uh, we did the commis commissioners requested and got materials on your complaint and then I followed up and got some additional materials for the commissioners it's confidential at this point so we can't just share them at this point yeah, wasn't that fucked up I mean, we got some more information back it's the reason why we're going to ignore you but we can't share that with you because it's confidential point um, just so you know but, but my understanding is that the police department closed the internal investigations report and said they had no finding of anything. And then um, was it City Councilman Fagan who provided some additional materials to the Ombudsman's office in September, I believe. And the Ombudsman forwarded a request to the Chief of Police to reopen the investigation. So it was closed to reopen it. Uh, the commission heard back not too long before your last meeting with the Chief that the police chief was not going to reopen but it sounds like he has reconsidered and is looking at um, the difference in the materials that Mr. Fagan presented versus the materials in the police file they they contradict each other and so that's why he's looking to see what I mean next. that's all that is these three letters that he denied that they were involved and then I have the letter from the state and the county that he was behind it or the police you know whether him personally or not he's the chief and he ought to know the calls are made and what is done so um how many more years does one have to wait does one have to uh, sue the city is that the time to be listened to and i said it's not about money i want an apology and i want to know that they will ne never do that to me again or to other people that's all i wanted and i mm -hmm. got nothing so don't close the case please yeah. and so um kevin, kevin i think had a few more thoughts that he would sure if i could just continue then there's n there's n this is all complicated by the fact there's no ombuds person who is des designated officially <laughs> Mr. Burns had sent a letter and to the chief, and then he left. And we did, in our meeting, engage on your behalf with the chief, who told us that he would look at some other things. And as Mr. Beggs has said, some other information came out, which is confidential because it's on your personal case, complicated by that they're being. It's confidential because we can't tell you because it's yours now the dissenting member of this board will come up um, his name is very similar to two people that have appeared in history one of which um, there's absolutely no proof he has a connection to either of them but I'll mention it in any case one was a prolific spam spammer that was put out of business around 2004 and the other 
being um, Sarah Palin's, um, well, not mistress, but you catch my draft. You know, on Bud's person. So, uh, we didn't ignore you. Wait, stop. So those weren't conclusions, those are just, that's all I found. Doesn't necessarily mean that this person is either of those people. We did our best, even in light of taking a risk, actually, because the role of the commission, as I told you, is unclear in this case, whether we're, we're not supposed to adjudicate specific cases. We're overseeing the ombudsperson's office and the, and the office. Right. So we've done what we could, and um, the wheels continue to roll. Right, and I'd like to just clarify that um, when Kevin and I met with the chief, it was in a spirit of supporting the former ombudsman's letter requesting that this case be looked at again. And so we felt like, you know, certainly that's within the, the scope of, um, you know, just just appropriateness for the commission to support the, the that letter that he sent before he terminated his position and, and left. Sometimes I've been through that, it goes into the waste basket and nothing is going to be done. If he means mm -hmm. that, and I'll leave it up to clarified something having to do around about give or take 85 percent i'm opposed to what this commission has done in the last seven months and so i didn't walk out and protest just because you two are meeting with the chief when you say that it's written down and we're supposed to show me where because i don't believe it doesn't exist so it just needs to have a oppose 85 percent approximately 85 percent of what the commission has done since its formation that's why I walked out. I don't know that it would be appropriate to necessarily say 85% because I don't... That's my figure. 85% is my best guess. That's what I want right. down, but or, I, or I'm not going to prove it. Well, I don't it recall just go that. As is. I... All right, so we can see there's some um, controversy on the board. And like I'm saying, I, I don't know. I think this might have something to do with what's going on, on that board. Um... <laughs> It's worth looking into. I just don't have the means to do so. I don't think there's any information out there, but there's something going on. Um, this basically, this is just, as far as I can tell, this is a group of people that were selected by the city council who were to appoint an ombudsman whose job it was to, is to advocate the public's interest in complaints against the police. And this group is basically the guy's boss. Um, there is no ombudsman right now. He, the one that was in, um, is no longer there. Don't know the circumstances, and so the controversy on this council may have nothing to do with the current controversy that she's faced against. But I think it's just completely wrong that that she's facing any kind of of this criticism because it just doesn't make any sense. Um, but to claim that she has a lot of power, <laughs> which was the reason why I brought that up, no, they, they're, they're absolutely powerless. All they could do is show up to the police chief's office and say, can you please look into this again? The last ombudsman said so. <laughs> um, but that's it. They have no teeth. Um, so no, it's not a very powerful position for her to be in. And as the, the head of a NAACP office in Spokane, who knows if she may have the ability to influence whether certain avenues of um, attempts for recourse are pursued. I have no detail about that. Um, And you're not required to be a person of color. Um, to portray yourself physically. I mean, you know what? So if I dress up in 
traditional garb from China, <laughs> you know, dating centuries back? Am I presenting myself as Chinese? I mean, or the other way to look at it is, do I actually just simply want to um, wear those kind of clothes because I like them? Um... Now let me, here's something that is just wrong on, in flight. Now is there, trust me, you know, as an intelligent person, the fact that our country The fact that this happened to their country, this chokehold here they're talking about with Eric Gardner, um, is something we wouldn't want to have, have happen to anybody, African American, Indian American, American Indian, <coughs> Chinese, Martian, you name it, <coughs> okay? First of all, she's referring to a cultural memory. Um, if she has adopted, embraced, and is living, then the barriers of the African American culture, then why shouldn't that be part of her cultural memory, first of all, and second of all, if human beings are capable of um, deciding that they ought to do this to um, Eric Gardner because he is a black man, which we don't know if it's true, but assuming that was true, then we can only assume that at some other time there will be a group of people that are dumb enough to decide to do that because you're a of a certain race or of a certain gender. Really, it's not for one group to remember as a matter of just their culture that injustices have taken place, but actually any injustice taking place to any subgroup within our country it really is a threat to all of us because over time power changes. <laughs> New people groups come into power if that's the way we allow ourselves to remain segmented by group and eventually well, um, it'll be our turn to have be choked because we're white people, <laughs> um, or Chinese people, or Indian people, or whatever. Whatever the theme of the day is, um, the Germans that were carted off to the internment camps during World War II are, are certainly an example of white people that were discriminated against in this country. The Japanese that were carted off in the same fashion also were discriminated because of their race. It could happen to any race. It could happen to the white race. <laughs> um, no race is safe from this kind of idiocracy. And so what needs to be fought against is the idiocracy and the, re the remembrance of it certainly is, is important. Whether there's an implication of reading between the lines and um, leaps of faith that certainly her statement was crafted to get her a position on this board that has little to no power um, is only for a perverted presentation to the public of uh, to um, to digest um, and then this there's this thing about her father I'm not one to um, 
I'm, I'm only going to com comment on the, on the phenomena. I, I myself had a uh, a step great grandfather whom which um, when I would give him a hug, he felt like any other family member that I'd ever had. I had absolutely no blood relation to him that I'm aware of. It was a Jewish man named Albert Katsky. Brilliant man, very kind man. Um, the same could be said, probably, and perhaps for her, the person that she treats as her father. I'm not here to comment on anything else besides the fact that that is a very possible relationship. And once again, this father figure to her is an African American. That happens to be the circumstances in which her life lands upon. And to be persecuted for that is just absolutely fucking ridiculous. And it's none of our goddamn business, quite frankly. But apparently, since people want to prosecute her, I have to go through these details. <sighs> yes, we know the man in her photo is not her father. But was Julius Caesar Augustus Caesar's father? No. No, he wasn't. He was... Uh, Augustus Caesar was adopted uh, by Julius Caesar. He was not his father. Yet history often records that as fact. Um, and so what? The man in the photo is not her father. This doesn't mean that she got some rant stranger <laughs> named Albert Wilkinson to sign up to her scheme. Um for the sole purpose of being elevated to the high commission of a police ombudsman and the, um, the head of the Spokane um, chapter of the NAACP. No, I think it's probably because she has a relationship that is fatherly between herself and Albert Wilkinson, and I, I respect it, and I think it's a wonderful thing to have. And that's all that should be said about it. Um, so, whether her biological father is in Troy or not is not really all that relevant. Um, now, perhaps if someone could show me the, actually the smoking gun of some application that she'd filled out where she accrued some giant monetary benefit that um, um, that all this that could be construed as you know fraudulent had there actually been some kind of real aim <laughs> towards then okay I mean this is a little bit not very intelligent. I don't think that she wrote down that her father was uh, Albert Wilkinson on the police commission application. Um, even if she did, again, she, the police commission will tell you themselves, or the, the people that interviewed her will tell herself that being African American didn't qualify, or not any African American could walk up and say, hi, I'm African American, get me on that police ombudsman commission. All right, you're in. You know, there's got to be more to it than that, too, which no one, no one even talks about. They don't just say, okay, uh, if that was true, they have five black, I'm sure there are more than five black people in Spokane that would be interested in being on the commission. Um, yeah, in a legal sense, she doesn't have a stepfather, but in a... Um, personal sense that's that's your stepfather and because her parents are are estranged from her unfortunately that's that's the circumstance it is there's your birth certificate you know, whip it out let's call CNN let them know I mean I don't know what has pushed them to do this other than there's some something that's unfortunate that's happened in relationship between her and her birth parents. And, you know, I start using the, um, so, 
there's not much else to say about this other than I've seen a few videos. There's one person that I really feel has has tried his best to, in a very even-handed manner, to try to civilly, um, in a civil fashion, try to um, discuss the issues and explain both sides of the issues. Um, what a lot of African Americans are saying is that she didn't have to grow up as an African American to experience some of the things that African Americans do experience and that she always has the privilege of turning off her African American appearance um, once she um, feels like it which African Americans don't have a choice about. I, I do recognize that. But I also do recognize that, and I'm really mixed on this feeling, but I do feel that some of this has to be attempted. And that is to say that, you know, if we keep holding on to what has happened in the past, rather than what's going on right now with race issues, then, and it very well could be that there are things that are going right now, right? But if the argument's presented in such a way, well, it's all about the past, it doesn't help bring about a better future by forgetting about the past. There, there, there are things that, um, I could be upset about that, um, you know, everybody could bring up all their you know, bring, everybody could bring up their whole laundry list of gripes. Some people don't have any gripes. Some people do. I happen to have some gripes, but you know, there's no point in bringing it up in this whole thing. And probably he does too. You know, there's there's you know things that are unfortunate happen in this life, but to hold on to them, I think it's a little bit disempowering to the people, unfortunately, that think about these things and keep telling themselves that their life is going to be worse because they're black. Um, it doesn't help them get any better. But on the other hand, I do realize that they've been through what they've been through, and, you know, I can only say, oh, well, I wish it never happened. I mean, that's really wishy-washy. So there's no real absolute opinion that I have about other people's opinions, um, other than to say that I, when I hear some of the things that are said, it feels like there's a mark against me for something I didn't do and there's no forgiveness for it just because I'm white and I would rather not have that be the case I'd rather have it be that we all just get along but it is true um, even in slight when you drive across this country you can tell where people what part of the country people are from just slightly by their mannerisms and the way they do things and if it's a little more blatant um it could be because of you know um her decision to embrace the cultures that she has as her own and she ought not be persecuted for it and it's perfectly it could happen it's not impossible it wasn't some kind of deliberate choice um other than to say that it was just the way she wanted to live and the clothes she wanted to wear and, and the hair she wanted to have and the tan she wanted to have and I find it really unfortunate that she quit because I really haven't, I, it almost, at least to the, to the devilish critic that brought this nonsense up in the first place, it seems to um, be an unspoken confirmation of the stupid idea that somehow because she, quote, pretended to be African American has received some benefit that other people don't get and um, I find it distasteful to have news stories about that on um, national TV in as much that it'll play upon um, the in the hands of people who have memories of reverse discrimination or being victims of say of affirmative action and um, when in the case that's just misrepresenting what had happened in this case at all. Um, I hope this whole thing 
goes away. I hope she has a semblance of privacy. And in fact, I do hope she rethinks her resignation and she's able to go back. She should go back and she should go back there out of stubbornness. And not only that, in the name of really everybody's rights, not just African Americans, but everybody, everybody should have the right to be able to embrace the culture that they want to embrace, to um, live the life they want to live, dress they want, the way they want to dress, and distinctions about transgender and all this other crap is just nonsense to me. It's really pretty much all it is about is um, someone being crushed, that the story really is someone being disturbed and harassed by the machinery of the public specter that ought not to happen, and I'm completely against that. And I will do many more videos addressing that issue. I've already started with Bernard Articun, and I'm going to continue to do these kinds of things. And I'm, I do have a major project coming up that I'll be doing some more presentations on, but for now I'm going to address this because it's more or less timely.